from her hiding place under the bed, 22-year-old Corazon and Miro heard the horrific screams of her friends from the next room. An electric chill ran up her spine, her muscles locked, paralyzing her four foot eleven frame, blood already streaming down her cheeks like tears. She tried not to imagine what was happening to her nursing school roommates. If she had any chance of getting out of this alive, a clear head was really needed. However, she could never get out of her head the image of that horrible pot marked face monster. The same monster she had been face to face with just moments earlier. Another scream jolted her back from her dimming senses. She felt every instinct to run, but the monster had a gun and a knife. Running was not an option. Hours earlier, Corzine stood outside waiting for the shuttle bus to take her home. She shared a townhouse with eight other nurses. It was July 13, 1966, a blistering 89 degrees in Chicago. Lyndon Baines Johnson was in the White House. The Vietnam War was raging and a riot was happening on the west side. But on the south side of Chicago, something much more sinister was occurring simultaneously. Corazon was a visiting exchange nurse from the Philippines. Her long shift at the South Chicago Community Hospital had just ended. From the window of the bus, she gazed at the city landscape rolling past. Her mind drifted home, not to the townhouse, but to the poor city of Batangas in the Philippines. She felt it would be a relief to sit on her bed, write letters home, then drift off to sleep. In Manila, Corzine had studied nursing in college. After graduating, she made a terrifying and exciting decision to apply for a nursing exchange program in the United States. Now here, it felt like a world away, but she loved it. And the wages were good enough that she could send money home to her family. The shuttle soon arrived at her townhouse, left on the sidewalk in a cloud of exhaust as it pulled away. And as though in a dream, she looked up at the townhouse thinking, I am so far away from the slums of Manila. But those slums made her strong. They had made her resourceful. She didn't know it yet, but she would need to be all of those things soon enough. The front door of the townhouse was unlocked. As always, in 1966, this was common practice because no one knew that monsters hunted in the night. Once inside, Corazon trudged up the stairs to her room. Two others shared the bedroom with her, fellow nurses from the Philippines, Malita and Valentina. They were all like family. Corzine changed into her pajamas and gathered her clothes to do laundry. She casually carried the basket downstairs to the washroom. The townhouse was full of life and activity from her fellow nurses. Someone was cooking adobo, a traditional Filipino dish, and the delicious smell awakened her stomach. In the kitchen, she sat at the table with a bowl of food, talking with the other girls about their day, the patients, and the doctors. It was so much laughter, and her decision to come to America had been one of the happiest in her life. Now back in her room, Corzine pulled out her stationery and began her letters. Though she knew how much her family missed her, she understood just how much pleasure it gave them to see the joy in her letters. Voices reached her from the other rooms. Patricia, Pamela, and Nina shared a bedroom, and another slept Gloria, Mary, and Suzanne, but they weren't home from their shift yet. In her, in her own room, Valentina was already snowing lightly, Corazon ready to work clothes for the next day. Outside, in the dark of night, the monster, the boogeyman, was approaching. Richard Speck, an infamously notorious name now. Born in Kirkwood, Illinois in 1941, Speck was the seventh of eight children. His mother was a very religious person and a teetotaler. When Speck was six, his father died from a heart attack. 
Note this, lack of a father figure is common amongst serial killers. When Speck was nine, his mother remarried. Her new husband had a long criminal record that ranged from forgery to DUIs. The family soon moved to Dallas and changed addresses frequently, mostly living in poor neighborhoods. Speck loathed his drunk and verbally abusive stepfather. He also struggled in school, stayed back in the eighth grade, and refused to wear glasses because he feared ridicule. He briefly attended high school, but failed every class, so he soon dropped out. Despite loathing his stepfather, the boy began drinking alcohol when he was 12 years old. By 15, he too was a full-fledged drunk. His first arrest was at the age of 13 for trespassing. He was arrested dozens of times over the next eight years. When he was 19, he began working as a laborer. A year later, he knocked up a 15-year-old girl and they were married when Speck was 21. Their daughter was born in 1962. In 1963, Speck was sentenced to three years in prison for forgery. He had attempted to cash a stolen paycheck from a co-worker. After 16 months, he was paroled, but a seemingly different type of Richard Speck emerged from prison this time. Three weeks later, wielding a 17-inch carving knife, he attacked a woman in the parking lot of her apartment. He ran when the woman began screaming, but was caught a short time later and sent back to jail. However, due to a clerical error, he was back on the streets in six months. The monster was growing. One thing we see again and again is an alarming inability to keep our monsters behind bars for very long. Months after he was released, he stabbed men in a bar fight. Again, he was jailed, this time for three days. He then robbed the grocery store. The police traced the getaway car and issued an arrest warrant. It would have been Speck's 42nd arrest, but he fled to Chicago, where Corzine and eight fellow nurses lived in the townhouse. But before we get back to Corzine hiding under the bed, listening to the screams of her roommates, we must trace the final path of the monster in the preceding weeks. On April 3rd, Miss Virgil Harris, 65 years old, came home at 1 a.m. to a knife-wielding burglar. The man was six feet tall, polite, and spoke softly with a southern drawl. He blindfolded her, tied her up, and raped her. A week later, Mary Catherine Pierce, a 32-year-old bartender, was reported missing after leaving her work. Her corpse was later found in a hog house behind the tavern she worked, also the same tavern frequented by Richard Speck. Police by now were on to him, but he moved on. On July 13th, Speck spent the entire day doing the usual drinking. He met a 53-year-old barfly named Ella May at one of the finer establishments he frequented. He took her back to his cheap hotel room, raped her, stole her pistol, then staggered toward the townhouse, where he knew the nurses lived. The front door was unlocked. Richard Speck pulled the pistol from his pants pocket, slowly pushed the door open. There were no signs of anyone in the kitchen or the other rooms downstairs. Slowly. Speck crept up the stairs toward the bedrooms. A little light came from beneath the first door on the right. He knocked. Inside the room, Corazon was under the covers. She just finished her last letter home. Her roommates were asleep. She was about to turn off the bedside lamp when she heard the knock. Tiptoeing over to the door, she opened it just a crack. Yes, she asked. The pot-marked face man towered over her in the crack of the door. The smell of liquor and cigarettes was overpowering. Please, he said, I need help. Corazon hesitated. Two contradictory instincts fought within her. On the one hand, she knew the hard streets of vanilla and the voice in her head screamed aloud, alarm. 
this man is dangerous. But on the other hand, she was a nurse. Her life's calling was to help people in need. But in her moment of hesitation, the monster struck like a raging bull. He pushed his way through the door as Corzine pushed back hard, but it was no use. Although she was tough, she could not resist, and she stumbled back and fell to the floor. That's when she noticed the pistol in his hand. Melita and Valentina woke wide-eyed. Speck used the gun as a pointer and motioned them out of the bed. While her roommates were on the edge of panic, Corzon remained calm. She spotted the long hunting knife strapped to Speck's waist. She also noticed he was swaying from intoxication. Speck told him to do just what he said and no one would get hurt. However, street smart Corzine knew not to be fooled by these words. Speck left them in the room to continue his search. They could hear him yelling at the women in the other rooms. They heard terrified voices and sobs from the other girls. Three of them were pushed into Corzine's room. Patricia, Pamela, and Nina. They were clutching their purses and sobbing. Hopefully, this was a robbery and nothing more. Specht followed them in, ordered them to dump everything on the bed. Corzine kept a keen eye out, waiting for her, her opportunity. Speck soon pocketed the pistol and pulled out the hunting knife. He ripped the bedding off the beds, pillows, blankets went everywhere. He began cutting the sheets into long strips. The, ter the terrified women watched helplessly. One by one, Speck began binding the hands of each woman. Then they heard the door on the first floor open. Corazon felt her heart drop to her knees. When she heard the voices, the three other nurses had come home. Pistol again in hand, Speck left them in the room so he could go out and confront the other girls. Now they could hear them coming up the steps. Soon screams of terror echoed in the hallway. Speck shoved them into the room as well. Now all nine nurses were inside Corazon's bedroom. He made the new arrivals empty their pocketbooks, and then he tied their hands. Taking advantage of Speck's intoxicated state of mind, Corazon made her first move, shrugging their figure hands. Melita and Valentina attempted the same. Not noticing, Speck tried to reassure the woman in his soft southern drawl. Relax. This will be over soon and no one will get hurt. Corazine and her two roommates soon had their hands free. They tried not to draw his attention. With Speck distracted, Corazine gave the roommates a silent signal and they ran off. The three of them reached a dark room, closed the door and hid. They listened intently for Speck's voice from the other room. He was still trying to calm the frightened six women. Of course, I noted he was a convincing liar. He told them he needed money for a trip to New Orleans. Alita and Valentina quickly debated how to appease the boogeyman so he'd leave them alone. But Corzine wasn't fooled. Every instinct told her what the monster intended to do. Speck led one of the terrified nurses from the room at gunpoint to where the three were hiding. He forced her to try to convince them to come out, promising he wouldn't hurt anyone. This actually convinced Corzine's two roommates to leave the room. But she pleaded with them not to go. But their minds were made up. Corzine ducked down beside the bed and hid further away. As she crouched in the darkness, she heard the sounds of muffled cries, shuffling feet, sobs, begging for mercy, then shrieks of pain and horror. The screams were soon cut off, followed by a thud. Corzine could only wipe the tears from her face. She heard Speck drag one of her friends into the other room. Finally, Corzine took a chance and peeked out into the hallway. One of the nurses lay dead in a pool of blood. 
She stifled her gasp. More screams reached her. One by one, Speck was leading the girls out of the room and killing them. Corazon tried to think. She hoped the monster had lost track of her, lost count of how many girls there were. She began formulating a plan. If she kept on the move, the drunk man might not be able to figure out where she was or where he'd already looked. Then another scream and another thud, then footsteps and more begging. Corazon went under one of the beds. Part of her wanted to block her ears from the sounds of horror that came from the other rooms and the hallway, but survival meant absorbing every bit of information she could. So she had to listen the footsteps again. Now he was in the room, the same room with her. She held her breath, her heart pounding against her ribs, and then she heard him say, I won't hurt you. Amazingly, his voice still sounded polite and convincing. His large shoes were inches away from her eyes, laying unmoved under the bed. What would she do if his pot-marked face appeared? She was tempted to close her eyes and pray for deliverance, because she knew the only way to survive was to save herself. He moved a few feet to the next bed and crouched down to look under it. There were three beds, and she understood he would check under all of them. The only way to avoid being caught was to move just at the right time. When he stood again, her pulse raced. If he chose her bed next, she would be done. But if he went to another bed, there was a chance, a 50-50 chance she could slip out into the hallway unnoticed. Speck rose to his feet for a long time. He didn't move. Was he so drunk that he was disorientated? And then his feet started for the other bed. Now was her chance. When she felt the moment was right, she poked her eyes just above the mattress to see where he was. He was just bending down to look under the next bed. She waited until his head was below the mattress, and then she quickly slipped out from under the bed, praying the floor wouldn't creak or she would not bump into something that would make noise and get his attention. Corzine started to run toward the stairs, at the bottom, the door to safety, freedom. But the sound of whimpering came from her room. Her nursing instincts were triggered. She stopped. She could not leave her friend behind, so she went into the room. There she saw Gloria tied up and gagged, secured to a desk chair, her eyes pleading with Corazon. She went into her and started pulling feverishly at the knots, but the footsteps came fast and angry. She dove under the bed again. Gloria whimpered and cried loudly as Speck staggered into the room. Corazon didn't make a sound. Again, his feet were a foot away from her face. Speck tried to comfort the nursing student, but by now, no one was fooled. Through her gag, Gloria begged him. He untied her from the chair, stood her up. By then, Corzine saw her friend pulled onto her toes. Her begging turned to cries of agonizing pain. He was strangling her and it seemed to take forever. Corazon felt the anger to cry out for him to stop. But she knew, she knew it would only mean certain death for her, for the both of them. Then a fountain of blood poured onto the floor, splashing onto Corazon's face. What felt like an eternity, Speck just dropped Gloria like a bag of old laundry. Corazon felt the thud of her friend hit the floor and her lifeless eyes stared right at Corazon. But she dared not move. Speck went to another room and more screams followed. Corazon reached out to touch her face of her friend. Angry boiled over within her. Maybe if she had a weapon, she'd kill this man herself. But she disciplined her emotions. Stay cool. 
stay alive. For a nightmarishly long time, Corazon lay next to her dead friend, her blood drying on her cheeks. At times, she closed her eyes and prayed again for deliverance. At some point, all the noise stopped. No footsteps, no screams, no cries. Was the boogeyman gone, or was he just waiting for her to reveal herself? She couldn't risk it, and so she waited. Minutes became hours. When the sun began beaming through the window, she finally emerged from under the bed. Horror awaited her. All eight of her friends lie mangled and dead. Blood collected in dry pools everywhere. But she didn't believe the monster was gone. No way. No way would this beast leave a witness alive. He probably was downstairs on the first floor waiting for her to show herself. So she opened the window, climbed out onto the ledge, and screamed at the top of her lungs for help. It took about 20 minutes for her screams to be before someone finally came. Speck indeed had gone. Perhaps in his intoxication, he had forgotten about her. Once again, the police captured Speck. They matched fingerprints, and in the hospital, he even confessed. But the system cannot be trusted to deal with monsters, and Corzine did not leave it just to the system. She faced the beast, the boogeyman, the pot-marked faced man, Richard Speck, one more time. Nine months after the murders, she took the stand in court. She stared down Speck with the courage of a warrior. Her testimony was so compelling and left an indelible mark on everyone in that courtroom that day. Speck was convicted and sentenced to execution, but Speck himself was not done. By no means, monsters like him seldom are in this country. His lawyers appealed and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. The basis of the appeal? Potential jurors who were against the death penalty had been excluded from the jury. Speck's lawyers argued he therefore received an unfair trial. Many questions arose. Would he be freed? In a split decision, the court did reverse his death sentence, but his conviction would stand. The beast would spend his life in prison. He hoped for eventual parole, and maybe he would have gotten it, whether it was karma, fate, or destiny. We're not sure. But a heart attack took him at the age of 50. There are two interesting tales from prison which give us insight not only into him, but perhaps into serial killers altogether. An anonymous videotape was smuggled out of the prison a few years before Speck's death. The tape showed various prisoners taking drugs and performing explicit sex acts. In one scene, Speck performed oral sex on another prisoner. He now had female breast. Apparently, hormones had been smuggled into the prison. He was parading around in silk panties. He boasted, if they knew how much fun I was having, they would let me loose. Strange. In the video, Speck admitted to killing the nurses. When asked why, he shrugged and said it just wasn't their night. Asked how he felt about himself, like I always felt. I had no feelings. If you ask if I felt sorry, no. One time in prison, Speck had an injured sparrow come into his room through a broken window. He nursed it back to health. He kept it as a pet with a string tied around its leg. When a guard noticed and told him he couldn't keep it, Speck then walked over to a spinning fan and threw the little bird into the blades. The guard said, I thought you loved that bird. Speck replied, very coldly. I did, but if I can't have him, no one can. <laughs>